If it's Friday, Vice President Kamala Harris sits down with Chuck Todd for a Meet the Press exclusive, delivering a scathing critique of the Supreme Court as Democrats focus on abortion heading into the midterms. We've got the very first piece of that exclusive interview ahead. Plus, King Charles on the world stage for the very first time as king, addressing a nation in mourning from Buckingham Palace. His remarks and the Queen's extraordinary legacy ahead. And Congress campaigns and the rising threat of political violence. I'll talk to one of the House's top Democrats, Pramila Jayapal, about the increasingly toxic political climate and why it is personal for her. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker and for Chuck Todd, who is in Houston today for an exclusive interview with Vice President Kamala Harris. We are getting the very first look at their one on one conversation in just a moment. That exclusive sit down is happening as the White House ramps up its midterm messaging with election season in full swing now. President Biden hit the trail again last night at a party event in Maryland, laying out the White House's roadmap for Democratic campaigns across the country. So I want to be crystal right? clear about what's at stake in the ballot. Your right to choose is on the ballot. No, this is a fact. These, these are not, it's not hyperbole, any of this. Your Social Security that you paid for is on the ballot. Your safety of your kids from gun violence is on the ballot. The survival of our planet is literally on the ballot. Your right to vote, even our democracy is on the ballot. Are you ready to fight for these things? Well, as you just heard the president say, abortion is on the ballot, and that is now quite literally true in Michigan. That is a state where the state Supreme Court yesterday allowed a referendum on abortion to make it onto the ballot this November. And as we saw over the summer in Kansas, that could be a big motivating factor for voters. Now, in his exclusive interview with the vice president, Chuck asked Vice President Harris about her confidence in the Supreme Court after its ruling earlier this year to overturn Roe v. Wade. She did not mince words. We have some polling that shows confidence in the Supreme Court is at its lowest level that we've measured in over 20 years. Um, how much confidence do you have in the Supreme Court? I think this is an activist court. What does that mean? It means that we had an established right for almost half a century, which is the right of women to make decisions about their own body as an extension of what we have decided to be the privacy rights to which all people are entitled. And this court took that constitutional right away. And we are suffering as a nation because of it. That causes me great concern about the integrity of the court overall, especially as someone who my life was inspired by people like Thurgood Marshall, the work on that court of Earl Warren to bring a unanimous court to pass Brown v. Board of Education. This is the court that once, on one sat Earl Warren and Thurgood Marshall. Sandra Day O'Connor. It's a very different court. Some very powerful language there from the vice president. And you can see much more of Chuck's full interview with Vice President Harris on Sunday morning on Meet the Press. You do not want to miss that. My NBC News colleague Monica Alba is outside the White House monitoring this breaking news for us and these breaking developments. What we are hearing from the vice president, Monica, really astounding. You heard her refer to the Supreme Court as an activist court. We've been looking through our files, right, Mon? We can't really find any evidence that she or the president or, frankly, anyone else at the White House has used that type of language before. What do you make of it? It's certainly a sharper tone, Kristen, that's right, and it does continue on this sentiment that both the vice president and the president have expressed 
all summer long since Roe fell, and that is that this is a court that does have some extreme ideology. That was the language that was used in the days after the decision. And we have seen the vice president really take this on as one of her main responsibilities. She has dedicated a ton of time in the last couple of months meeting with state legislatures from 17 different states, traveling, crisscrossing the country to deeply red and purple states to try to make this argument and to talk about the importance, she says, of protecting reproductive rights. But you're right to point out that she hasn't used this specific forceful language in those exact words of calling it an activist court. And you saw there her expansion and defense of that position in the interview with Chuck that will air in full on Sunday, talking about specifically what she compares it to in terms of thinking back to court of yesteryear. And what's notable here is that really that line of attack of an activist court is something that Republicans used to talk about liberals back in the 60s and 70s. So we are seeing a shift here. And this is perhaps something that the White House is going to be using as a strategy heading into the midterm elections. You saw President Biden there discussing this, of course, at a DNC fundraiser. And in that primetime speech in Philadelphia last week, he talked specifically about the rights. And while not saying abortion in such explicit terms, he was implying that and talking about these extreme MAGA forces that are threatening that as part of everything he was talking about when it comes to his views on that being a threat to democracy. So abortion certainly an issue this White House sees as energizing voters, given what we saw in Kansas and in some other special elections. They think heading into November, that is a message that can resonate and clearly, again, a different tone from the vice president, extending what she has said in the past, but making it a little bit more intense in that interview heading into this final midterm stretch, Kristen. And Monica, as you make all of those great points, we're looking at some live pictures of the vice president in Houston at an event there. So, Monica, just let's talk strategy. I want to pick up on one of the key points that you made, which is that we are seeing this broader sharpening of rhetoric from the president who's talking about MAGA Republicans. He's gotten criticized from uh, some Democrats who are concerned that it's too heated, that, that he could actually alienate some independent voters, uh, some voters who are needed to win in some of these very close and critical races all across the country. So. Uh, do you think that this type of language from the vice president could fall into that category, could potentially be a step too far from the perspective of some voters? It's possible. And when we talk about this discussion of some Democrats being a little wary, look no further than today, where the president was traveling outside of Columbus, Ohio, to tout this manufacturing bill and legislative victory. But of course, there's a political backdrop to it. He appeared and uh, alongside Congressman Tim Ryan, who's running in that Senate race, who has been a little hesitant to appear with President Biden or campaign with him. And the president today did praise Representative Representative Ryan, he said he really was, his work was important and he talked specifically about his leadership. But what was notable is that when asked by reporters whether Joe Biden should run again in 2024, Congressman Ryan, who in the past has had a similar answer, said it's really up to him. He didn't give him a full throated endorsement or say definitively, yes, Joe Biden should run for re election. So that's an interesting part of all of this. But it's also, as we talk about in Ohio, in a state that many millions of voters turned out to support former President Trump. That's a place where Democrats would like to get some voters and make some inroads. And so that's why you have this sort of debate and tight line that Congressman Ryan is walking. And that was very evident today. So is it possible that could extend to these remarks by Vice President Harris? I think it does fall into that category and bucket for sure, Kristen, possibly. Um, I'm so glad you highlight that point, Monica. I'm going to have my panel coming up weigh in on that very thing. So thank you, Monica. I appreciate that. Great analysis at the top. Joining me now on set is my panel, Maria Hinojosa, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, anchor of the Latino USA podcast and an NBC News political analyst, Cornell Belcher, Democratic pollster and also an NBC News political analyst and former George W. Bush speechwriter and senior editor at The Atlantic, David Frum. Thanks to all of you for being here. I do want to get you to weigh in on the politics uh, that Monica was talking about uh, in terms of Tim Ryan not answering that question. But I want to start with this news that Chuck got in his interview with the vice president. Maria, let's just have you kick this off. I mean, that is very strong language. Chuck pressed her on what she thinks of the Supreme Court 
she could have answered in a range of different ways, and she decided to label the court an activist court. What do you make of that language? It's refreshing. As a woman who, and you know, I'm very public, and I tell the truth, right? Uh, I had two abortions when I was a very young woman, even though I was using birth control. And so to see the vice president say it is an activist court is affirming what many of us are feeling. So it's like, thank you, we're not being gaslit anymore. We understand that this is an activist court and that we are as women. And I love the fact that the vice president clearly said this is about privacy. Everybody's always talking about reproductive rights, abortion. This, it's about privacy. So I'm really glad that she made it very clear. I would have gone further, I would have said. Mm. And that's why we're going to think about and discuss very seriously about expanding the court, because we are challenged by an activist court now. David, what's your take? Um, I think we are uh, going to find that the country is better for where we have, have been on these uh, in, the pa in the past weeks. We are taking an issue that has been assigned to lawyers and pulling it to the voting booth. And the country's never found a, a stable resting place, never a consensus that Americans could live by. Um, and I think what has happened is um, a lot of the Republicans have had a, a free kick, a free soccer kick, where they could take much more extreme positions than their own voters wanted. And by bringing this into the political realm, I think 2022 will be very clarifying that the Republican position, as it's been enunciated, is not tenable. The party has to find a new one. What do you make of the vice president being the first one, though, really, in the administration to use that type of language? Well, maybe I'm a journalist and I'm used to stronger language. Activist <laughs> sounds like, actually, I don't agree that that's strong language at all. That's about the least strong thing she could say. Mm. Um, I, I think it's a, a little bit like saying, you know, inappropriate, tough words. Mm. Cornell? <laughs> well, I, I got to agree with David. I, I, I kind of chuckled it, it, it because it's not tough language for, for, for she, campaign she, season. She, what is notable to me, though, is that she's getting out in front of the president. I mean, we have not heard him use language, whether you want to call it strong or not. We haven't heard him <laughs> use that term, right? And she's getting out in front with this, and, and she has really been forceful. I mean, do you expect her to be the point person, the front person, the face of this push that, that the administration is making, and clearly Democrats more broadly, well, I, to make well, this an issue in the midterms? Well, it's election time, right? And sure. for the president and for the vice president, time for cutting deals, trying to cut deals, and the 50 50 Senate are over, it, it's, it's election season. So you do see them rolling out more tough language and trying to, in fact, define the terms of, 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 of this, of what the fall election is going to be about, using that bully pulpit. The, the president has absolutely, you know, given great speeches on this, trying to define this, but the vice president is an important voice in this because she is a unique vice president. And I'm, you know, there are, you know, she's not just a political figure, she's a cultural figure. She's the first woman to ever be this, and so many young women look up to her, and she's the first woman of color this. So she has a powerful voice in this, and she can connect with voters in, in ways that, quite frankly, a lot of us men can't mm. connect with it. So I think she's a very important voice for the fall. We talk about the impact of abortion on the midterms, and obviously everyone talks about Kansas. A and what we say about Kansas is that's an example where abortion was literally on the ballot. Well, now we have another one in Michigan mm -hmm. because Comes yet another state where abortion is on the ballot. Um, Maria, to what extent does that drive up, do you think, turnout? To what extent does that have an impact on what we see, not just in Michigan, but, but in other of these key states where maybe it's not so specifically on the ballot, uh, but a key issue that a candidate is raising? I'm a Midwesterner. I'm from Chicago. I mean, I'm a Mexican immigrant, but Midwesterners, we're kind of earnest in that sense. And what we heard from the vice president in that this is a court that is taking away rights, that resonates with all people, not just women. And, and what about Latinos? Do you think that it will, what will the impact be broadly? And obviously, it's going to be different depending on what state, what right. community we're talking about. Well, look, the Latino vote on the issue of, of abortion is actually complicated mm -hmm. as... You know, as I've been saying, Latino voters, Latina voters were complicated. And actually, there is a big push to get Latinos and Latinas to and kind of be staunchly anti-abortion. Mm -hmm. So many young Latinas, the first protest rally that they'll go to is not a pro-immigrant rally. It will be an anti-abortion rally. They have been working on this for decades, right? It's one of the reasons why I believe Florida went for Donald Trump. But... Latinas have abortions at the rate that everybody else does. So this is a very personal issue as well, an issue of privacy. But I do think that this is going to rev up women. And there are Trump supporters who are women, who I speak to, who are pro-choice. So 
it will deflate, I think, their interest in coming out. How nervous does that make some Republicans, David, to hear that? Um, look, the, the Republican and Democratic Party do not work at all in the same way. Um, the Democratic coalition is much bigger, but it's more divided, more disparate. So, um, whereas uh, if you're trying to get Republicans together to get to vote, you think about what is the one big issue that most Republicans care about? Talk about that and deliver them to the full polls in one big phalanx. With Democrats, you're activating issue after issue. There are a lot of people who are going to vote for Joe Biden in 2024 who do not like his domestic agenda at all. That's why he never talks, for example, about the student loan relief. Um, when he goes through his accomplishments, he, that was to activate a particular constituency, even though it's generally not all that popular. And again, so it's a matter of opening up the faucets of the Democratic Party one by one, understanding they often disagree. They often may not even get along all that well. I, I will say this, and, and going back to, the, to, to your point about Latino voters, here is, the, here is the fundamental problem with what the Supreme Court did. It is, we see in a lot of data, even people who are supposedly pro-life don't like the overturning of Roe v. Wade because it does become an issue about privacy. It does become an issue about rights. And what we're seeing, and again, you look at Kansas. When you get the 60% of the vote in Kansas, that's not just Democrats, because mm -hmm. Lord knows we don't have 60% of the vote in, in Kansas is Democrat. And a state after state, and when you, when you look at Michigan, there's an opportunity to, to peel off probably a quarter of Republican women who, quite frankly, may not be pro-choice as we think about it, but don't like what, what the state is doing. Go ahead, David, doing. and then I want to play that's, something that, that we heard from Joe Biden That's how we're going night. to get a national resolution. The Republicans have been occupying a position on abortion that their own party doesn't actually support because mm -hmm. it was free. It's now not free. Um, and <laughs> the, the Supreme Court may, in the end, have done this country an enormous favor uh, by uh, putting the United States on the path to a resolution that mo more Americans can live with than could live with it before. Yeah. I want to play a little bit of what we heard from Joe Biden. This was last night. This is on the stakes in November. Take a listen to what he had to say. Imagine if we just elected two more Democrats to the Senate and keep the House of Representatives. Imagine. We'll codify Roe v. Wade. We'll ban assault weapons. We'll protect Social Security and Medicare. We'll pass universal pre-K. We'll restore the child care tax credit. We'll protect voting rights. We'll pass election reform. We'll make sure no one ever tries to steal an election again in America. And we'll continue to build an economy. It's a long list, Maria, and uh, can't be done through reconciliation. I mean, it, what he's basically saying, it's, it seems like, is let's get rid of the filibuster to get all of this stuff done. I mean, is that a winning message? Do you think that's an effective strategy looking forward? Look, I think anything that makes Joe Biden look like he's standing up and he's angry and he's kind of had enough, his speech in Philadelphia, where some people are saying it's too much, our democracy is in peril. Our democracy is in peril. And to not be forceful, so that, yeah, it's a long list. But I'm like, hi, Joe. Yeah, let's see more of this. I, I think it will, in fact, inspire some people. Not everybody, but some. So, and yet, Cornell, the, the president's getting more fiery in his language. And yet you have, as, as Monica said in her reporting, Tim Ryan in Ohio not willing to say, yes, Joe Biden should run again in 2024. These candidates still have to walk a very fine line. Well they, well, they do, but I also, you know, I, I worked one time for a guy by the name of Barack Obama, and after 20, going into 2010, a lot of Democrats were saying the same thing about, I mean, you remember there were people saying that Barack Obama shouldn't run again. Sure. So I think, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to put that absurdity aside. What I think is really important about what the president is doing, and some of them say, well, he, did he go too far? Look at Reuters polling that just came out. And, you know, a majority of Americans now see Donald Trump and his movement as a threat to democracy. I don't know, call me crazy, but maybe, just maybe a Democrat or the president should actually try to drive a message mm -hmm. as opposed to sitting back and waiting. So all those people who say that he went too far, look at that data where Americans are right now and tell me he should not have driven that message. We're two months out from the midterms, David. Does this type of language seem like a more... Uh, controlled strategy, one yeah. that, that is clearer and, and potentially yeah. could upend some of these races. Again, I, the thing I want people to think about this is when, if, you're, if you're opening, if you're trying to get Republicans to vote, it's like those old movies on the battleship where you're turning one big wheel to get a big <laughs> sluice of water going. But the Democratic Party, it's lots of little wheels to get lots of different sluices. So there are voters, um, the never Trump voters, the people who um, delivered um, seats like Texas 7 and, um, and other other seats the Democrats won in 2018, 
who respond only to the democratic me uh, to the de democracy message and to none of the other messages and their other voters. All right, we will leave it there with that imagery. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Great conversation, Maria Cornell and David. Appreciate it. And be sure to catch Chuck's entire exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Vice President Harris this Sunday. That's on Meet the Press on your local NBC News station. A lot more headlines in that. Coming up, Queen Elizabeth's historic 70-year reign comes to an end, and a new era begins in Britain with a new king and a new prime minister, the queen's legacy and the country's future next. Plus, immediate and serious harm. That's the warning from the Justice Department as it appeals a judge's ruling which halted its access to documents recovered at Mar-a-Lago. What it means for the case and the former president. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. As the world continues to mourn the passing of Queen Elizabeth, a new era begins in the United Kingdom with a new monarch for the first time in seven decades. King Charles III returned to London today, greeted by a crowd who gathered at Buckingham Palace, waiting to see him and to pay their respects. He addressed the nation and the world for the first time as king. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. I, too, now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. But the change in the monarchy is not the only leadership change the UK has seen this week. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss began her tenure just three days ago. She met with the new king at Buckingham Palace earlier today, as you see there. The country will now enter a 10-day period of national mourning. Gun salutes and church bells could be heard across the country, paying tribute to the only monarch most people in the U.K. had ever known. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., President Biden has confirmed that he will attend the Queen's funeral. I'm joined now by Matt Bradley, who's on the ground in London, former royal editor for ITV News and an NBC News royal contributor, Tim Ewart, and NBC News presidential historian, Michael Bashloss. Thanks to all of you for being here. Matt, I want to start with you. The news starting to sink in now on this first full day that the U.K. has a king now day after it has lost its queen. What is the mood like there in London? Well, look, I mean, Kristen, you're not going to walk around and see it in public. You know, uh, Britons aren't crying into their tea or their pints in pubs. It's still everybody is keeping calm and carrying on, which is a terrible cliche, but it's it really is the truth here. But there is emotion that is, is coming out, and you're hearing it in conversations with people. Uh, you're hearing it on the radio from people calling in and people who have been interviewed on TV. You know, it's around, and people do really feel And one of the things that I've really noticed and a lot of the testimonies that I've heard from ordinary people is the extent to which, even though this was a woman who was so impossibly uh, distant, someone who you could not ex you know, access for an ordinary person, everybody who has been talking about her has a personal anecdote that they want to tell. You know, they want to say and explain how the queen impacted them personally. And a lot of people have said the same thing. She felt like a member of our own family. So while this woman who lived in a castle, separated from the public, even as she made every effort to try to feel as though she was amongst the people. She was successful in that effort. And the testimonies and, and the speeches that we've been hearing really just go to show that so many people felt close to her, even though she was so distant and so far away. It's such an important point, Matt. And of course, throughout her tenure, she met with 13 sitting presidents. They each had personal anecdotes about her. Very briefly, Matt, what can we expect from this 10-day period of national mourning? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, just going to be pomp and ceremony. It's going to be going all the way from Scotland and Balmoral all the way down to here in London. And in, in the next 10 days, you're going to see what the British royal family, the monarchy, does best. And that is kind of papering over this moment of mourning with pomp and circumstance, with symbolism. Um, you know, and, and that is something that distracts people from their grief, to show that there is continuity, to give tribute to this woman who lived a life of service, to 
wish, wish their best wishes to the new king, but also to unite together as Britons. And it comes at such a fractious moment. Uh, and it's ironic that the loss of the sovereign is something mm. that really has brought a lot of Britons together. Politically, they're facing so many challenges. And of course, as you mentioned, this is an extraordinary changing of the guard. It's not just the head of government, not just the head of state, excuse me, it is the head of government. Two major figures, the prime minister and the queen, um, have both left and have both been replaced. It is a new moment, a new era for Britain, and one in which a lot of people here are hoping that they can be united in tragedy. And, and Tim, pick up on that point. This is a new moment, a new era. Uh, we heard from the new king today for the very first time. What do you make of what we heard from him and, and this remarkable, extraordinary moment for the UK and the world? Well, you know, Charles faces a challenge as he takes over the monarchy here. He's succeeding a, a woman who was incredibly popular in this country, and he starts from a position himself of not being particularly popular. He isn't one of Britain's favourite royals. But I have to say that today he took some big strides towards correcting that. Mm. The, the first thing that... that, that was so noticeable was that when he arrived back at Buckingham Palace with Camilla, who's his queen consort, he immediately went to the crowds that were outside the palace. He walked along the line. He shook everybody by the hand. He got some hugs. He even got a kiss. Some people saying, God save the king. Um, bless you, Charles, and all of that. And that showed that he does have a human touch, despite that reluctance to give him the benefit of the doubt uh, on the question of popularity among many people here. He does have a human touch. He is very at ease with the crowds. And then in his speech, I think he was really very moving, uh, on a personal level, very moving. He spoke eloquently about taking on the role of the Queen, of keeping up her promise to serve the nation until the end. Uh, and he also, it, it is worth noting, extended a very public olive branch to Harry and Meghan, mm. very pointedly expressing his love for them. Now, they are not popular at all in this country at the moment, very controversial. That has pained Charles greatly. And I think that was quite a significant moment there. And clearly, he hopes that people will try to forgive what they perceive as the wrongs committed by uh, Harry and Meghan. Mm. And I know that there is also some hope that there will be some reunification between the two brothers there. Michael Bachelos, we always turn to you in these moments, these big moments to help us process them. Mm. And we're so grateful that we have you for that. Help us process what the weight that King Charles now bears and what you are anticipating as he now moves forward as king. He is a very different king than his mother was queen in the sense that yes. he is someone who has made climate change, for example, one of his big issues. What are you expecting to see from him and how do you think he will, if he does, keep the monarchy relevant? Oh, I think that's exactly the way to frame it, Kristen, because, you know, here he is coming in. Uh, is Queen Elizabeth an act that you or I would like to follow? Uh, she is not. And even 24 hours after yesterday, we are now appreciating, I think, even more historically what a piece of work she really was. Mm. You know, what a place that she had in the world. How seriously she was taken by presidents and prime ministers. That will be hard for Charles to replicate, especially because it's going to be inevitable that, you know, when he goes down a rope line the same way wasn't a rope line, but shakes hands with a crowd the way he did today in front of Buckingham Palace, all those people, or most of them, were saying, you know, thank you, nice to shake hands with you. But in their minds, they were saying, we wish you were her, your mother. Mm. That will go on for a while. So he's got to know, not only, as you were saying, you know, find a place in the hearts of the British people that he has not yet had and that the Queen, against all odds, established even though coming from an opulent background. The one thing that I think is more hopeful for him is exactly what you're saying, Kristen. You're talking about climate change. He's amazingly well-versed on policy. He has met presidents and prime ministers since he was a child. 
This is about the most experienced person uh, nearly ever to become a monarch in the United Kingdom, and that should count for a lot. So if they can combine that with emotional intelligence and get uh, the British people to see his heartbeat, I think there's a lar large possibility that he will be a successful king and preserve the monarchy. What a brilliant point, just how prepared he is for this moment. He is in his 70s. Michael, I keep thinking about the fact that she was only in her 20s when she became queen. Right. A a and let me just have you and then Tim pick up on this point. This is a change in leadership, not only at the monarchy, but a new prime minister. How potentially uh, challenging is that for the people of Britain as they also deal with an economy in crisis and a range of other issues? Uh, it's almost like planets coming together. You know, when the queen became the queen in 1952, January, at the age of 25, she had a little help because guess who the prime minister was? It was Winston Churchill. Mm. If you're a young person becoming monarch, I think you'd want Churchill to be there to guide you. But here we have a new king and a new prime minister who came up very far, very fast. So it's something that the British people are not accustomed to. But I, I think the biggest problem that the king is going to face is there's nothing in Talmudic law that says that Britain has to have a monarchy. Mm. It does because the queen did such a great job for 70 years. Whether it does in the future, whether Britain is relevant in the world, will depend an awful lot, not only on who's prime minister, but how well the king performs. Well, and, and you just capture so well uh, how heavy the weight is for Charles. Tim, very quickly, your thoughts on this new chapter with a new monarch and a new prime minister. Yeah, I think that analysis there from Michael was, was, was spot on, actually. I mean, we are a country uh, on the brink of a crisis, if not in a crisis. There are lots of problems here. Divisiveness really is, is very prevalent now. We're a very divided nation. Angry views are being expressed on both sides. We've got uh, a brand new king, although he's 73 years old, and a new prime minister. They both face huge challenges. I personally think that Charles will rise to the occasion. I think he will win over the public. Uh, I think he knows how to do that. And don't forget, he's got William at his side, mm. who's going to take over the reins of arguing some of the cases and championing some of the causes that uh, the king cannot now do. So I think he will do well. Liz Truss, I, I'm not a, a political expert at all. She faces challenges that are just as big. Mm. All right. Well, Tim and Michael, thank you so much for oh, helping us to process this historic and very weighty moment. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you a lot. Coming up next, the Justice Department pushes back against a court ruling that's temporarily blocked its access to sensitive documents recovered at Mar-a-Lago, arguing that U.S. national security might be at risk. That reporting and what happens next after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Former President Trump's legal team has until Monday to respond to the Justice Department's appeal of a judge's decision to appoint a special master to review documents obtained from Mar-a-Lago. The Justice Department announced its plan to appeal yesterday, arguing that a former president cannot assert executive privilege to prevent the executive branch from reviewing its own records. The DOJ is also asking for a partial stay of the judge's ruling while that appeal is pending, writing, quote, a stay would simply allow the government to continue to review and use the same records, which, again, indisputably belong to the government, not plaintiff in its ongoing criminal investigation as well. For more on all of this, I'm joined by NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, it is great to see you. Thanks for being here. So break down for you, what are the key takeaways of this appeal? What's the significance here? So we don't know yet what they're going to argue to the appeals court, but we know what they've asked this judge in the case, and they've asked her to reconsider her order that they not that they're not able to use the 100 classified documents that they took out of Mar-a-Lago in their investigation and they also don't want a special master to look at those documents they're saying 
That person can look at 10,000 other documents we took out of there, but not the classified documents because, they say, these are not the property of Donald Trump. They are U.S. government records. There's no plausible legal attorney-client privilege claim. And they say they're not subject to executive privilege. And they say the government needs to, because of this judge's order, they have put their damage assessment into the whether sources and methods or have been compromised. They put that on hold, and they're saying the government needs to start doing that because national security is at, at risk. They're saying the public uh, is suffering irreparable mm. harm because of this order, and they're asking the judge to put that part on hold. And when you say sources and methods can be at risk, for our audience, that means lives could be at risk. Absolutely. The... And they're saying, for example, that they found a lot of empty envelopes marked classified, and they need to figure out what was in those envelopes and what happened to that information. And some of these documents were among the most highly classified documents that exist in the United States. So what are the next steps in the appeal, Ken? And how much could this actually delay the investigation by the Justice Department? It's a good question. So tonight we are expecting uh, the Justice Department and the Trump side to propose names, possible names for the special master. And then by Monday, the judge has given the Trump side until Monday to file a response to this Justice Department uh, argument. And then we see what they take up to the 11th Circuit and we wait to see what this judge will do in response to the DOJ's request for the stay. All right. Ken Delanian, another busy weekend for you. Indeed. Thank you Me so too. much. Really appreciate Thanks, your being Krista. here. And coming up, as congressional campaigns enter the home stretch, lawmakers and candidates are facing growing threats of political violence. I'll talk to Democratic Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal as she goes public about her own harrowing experience with an armed suspect at her house. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Threats of political violence have become a sad, frightening, and unfortunately regular part of our political landscape in the past few years. Yesterday, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal released portions of threatening voicemails she's received, painting a picture of the vitriol leveled against lawmakers and the reality of what she herself has been facing. We do want to warn you, this is disturbing. Take a listen. You're going to get exactly what you deserve. Have a nice day. Hey, why don't you guys go back to where you came from? Hey, none of these are damn citizens. Your day is coming. Damn, as soon as the president's installed, like on November 4th or 5th, we're coming after all you mother. You're going to be scrubbing floors for the rest of your life. Congresswoman Jayapal published those voicemails following this story in The Washington Post, where she told the harrowing story of how a man stalked her home and harassed her before ultimately showing up at her house with a loaded gun. The man was arrested and prosecuted. Now, in addition to Congressman Jayapal, multiple lawmakers, primarily those who have spoken out against the former president, have reported receiving harassment and threats against them and their families. Democratic Congresswoman from Washington, Pramila Jayapal, joins me now to talk about all of this. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here to discuss this. We really appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Thank you. And I am sorry that you have gone through all of that. We want to say that at the top. Tell us, why did you decide to reveal these threats? Why was it important for you to release those tapes for the public to hear what you had received on your voicemail? Well, Kristen, it was in the context of the story that The Washington Post did um, about what happened to me. And again, what I felt is important is for people to understand the level of the violence, political violence, political rhetoric, racism and sexism that is underlying much of it that at least comes towards me um, and others, uh, particularly women of color that I know of. Um, and to understand that these are not isolated incidents, that these are, there is a direct line between the big lie, January 6th and the insurrection, and then what we are all experiencing, even in our homes um, at an individual level, and then what the impact is for our society and what is at stake. Because I think that is the most important thing for people to understand what has been unleashed and how we how important it is that we work quickly to try to 
restore ourselves to a society that can disagree about policy without threatening political violence, without uh, attempting to steal elections, without having an insurrection on the Capitol. And so um, in the course of that story, the Washington Post reporter, who was really excellent, Ruby Kramer, um, asked me about other threats I've received. And mm -hmm. I shared with her a, a whole series of voicemails, and we just released a few of them. This is normalized behavior that should not be normalized. And I think that's what's important for people to know. And Congresswoman, when you talk about January 6th, you, as you say, were there at the Capitol uh, as the rioters stormed inside. Uh, and you have asked for more security in the wake of that. Can you update everyone? Where does that stand? Do you feel like you have the protection you need in order to do your job effectively? Well, I, I'm not going to speak about my personal arrangements for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I think what ha what came to light to me is how much we do need to do as a Congress to assure member safety. And so I did take it upon myself to write a private letter. I don't want the details of that disclosed, again, for obvious reasons, um, to our leadership and to the Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms to help protect all members. This isn't just about me. This is about all of us being able to do our jobs. And I know from talking to members that this is a concern. And in fact, I've been responding to numerous texts ever since this happened, ever since I've spoken about this on a caucus call and put forward my very specific recommendations to members, I'm getting calls from members about very specific aspects of personal security as members attempt to um, update their own homes. And that's not really how it should work. And so I think I am really focused on trying to make sure that all of our caucus, all of our members, um, really all electeds, whatever, whatever party you're from, um, are protected uh, and some of it is is security, um, it, you know, and protection. Some of it is is prevention and yeah. really yeah. making clear what the lines of communication are in the event of a serious threat. Congresswoman, you talk about the fact that, from your perspective, you think that women of color are disproportionately targeted. One of your colleagues, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, gave an interview to GQ magazine this week. I, I want to read you what she said and then get your reaction on the other side. She said, I hold two contradictory things in my mind at the same time. One is just the relentless belief that anything is possible. But at the same time, my experience here has given me a front row seat to how deeply and unconsciously as well as consciously so many people in this country hate women and they hate women of color. Realistically, I can't even tell you if I'm going to be alive in September. Congresswoman Jayapal, that is devastating to read. C can you react to it? Do you feel the same way? Yes, I think that many of us feel the same way, and we've talked about it um, as women of color. If you listen to those voicemails, um, you will hear the di the difference. Um, not only do we get death threats and and people, you know, a man with a gun at my door, but also you get the racism and the sexism that underlies and propels a lot of the violence. The words that are used, the vitriol with which they are used, yeah. the sexism, yeah. xenophobia, and racism that is threaded to, through every single message that we receive is disgusting. It is not normal. It should not be allowed. It should not be uh, it should not be encouraged, which is, of course, what the last president did. Congresswoman. Uh, and, yeah. and I think it's really important for people to understand and, that. And before we run out of time, I do want to ask you about some of the rhetoric that we have heard from people in your own party right now against the backdrop of what is really a, a, an intensified, I think, political climate. The president's been criticized for referring to MAGA Republicans, as you know, as semi-fascist. Vice President Harris just told Tuck Chuck today that she believes that we have a, quote, unquote, activist court. And my question to you is about rhetoric broadly. Do you worry that that type of rhetoric, when you're talking about the president, the vice president from some of our top officials, just kind of gins up controversy in what's an already volatile environment? Kristen, I don't think they're equivalents. I don't think that um, calling insurrectionists uh, semi-fascists is is uh, wrong. I, I really think that the president did an, a very important thing, which is to call out the seriousness of what the country is facing. And I think that is very different than uh, people showing up at the Capitol 
to uh, to to launch a violent insurrection and steal an election or people showing up with guns at our doors and i think that's true uh no matter what side of the party you're talking about but i think we have to be careful about being so cautious to not call out what we see happening and in fact by doing that allow it to happen so i thank the president for his speech i think it was a very important speech to come from the white house and i think we have to be real about what we're confronting. Liz Cheney is being real. I think Democrats should be real. All right. Congresswoman Jayapal, we really appreciate your joining us to discuss this really important topic, and we wish you safety ahead of November and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Still to come, rising seas, rising costs. A new report details just how dire the climate crisis could soon get as officials battle a record-breaking heat wave out west. You're watching Meet the Press now. We're back after a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Relief is finally in sight for millions of Americans out west who have been dealing with an historic heat wave. Temperatures soared past 100 degrees this week, but it is now expected to cool off significantly this weekend. That is both a reprieve for people and for the California power grid, which was pushed to the limit with record-breaking temperatures. The state's grid operator extended its call for voluntary electricity conservative conservation for this evening in an effort to prevent rolling blackouts. It's the latest evidence of the burden prolonged heat waves driven by a changing climate has put on our infrastructure. To get a sense of how some communities are trying to respond to this climate crisis, Chuck met with Phoenix's chief heat mitigation officer while he was in Phoenix this week, and he got an on-the-ground look at how the city is preparing for a hotter future. So we, we called it the Office of Heat Response and Mitigation very intentionally. Two parts, two, two different missions. One is to protect people when it's hot. Mm -hmm. We've had more than 300 people die from heat exposure here in Maricopa County each of the last two years. That's a big problem. The biggest risk is certainly with our unsheltered community. So that's what we've really been trying to amplify our, our efforts on, communicating where public cooling resources are, mm -hmm. getting supplies in people's hands, but also trying to get people connected to social services like shelter and housing food stamps, ID, income, those are the big wins that I think can improve our heat resilience over the long term. When we talk about people that sometimes have to sleep in the streets, these streets are not safe, that physically is, not safe. You were showing me some temperatures here. Yeah, the street, streets can, can easily exceed 160, 170 degrees Fahrenheit to the touch on a hot summer day like today, and that, that poses a burn risk for human skin, uh, for puppy paws, for any cats that are out there. Uh, streets are very hot. There's two different colors here of the road um, that makes it easier for us to see. The lighter colored is this new technology, a cooler asphalt, I guess, or a cooler top. Yeah, we call it cool pavement here okay. in Phoenix. It's a coating that goes on top of the traditional asphalt. This well, is more traditional asphalt that we're staring yeah, at. Yeah, here, right, right? yeah, right here. What somebody might do in their own driveway or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. This, okay. is, this is what we use on thousands and thousands of miles of streets uh, here in Phoenix. This other coating is only on about 80 miles right now. This okay. is a more reflective coating that's designed to prevent the sunlight from getting into the asphalt column itself where asphalt is really good at grabbing heat, holding onto it, and slowly re-releasing it at night. If we can keep it out of the system, we can help make the city a little cooler. We've got uh, 156 Fahrenheit. We move over a little bit. I saw 158, 157. All right. So it is It is a very hot this surface. This is a well-done piece of meat. We're now on the cool pavement coating, uh, but we'll just pick a random location here and 151. Let's go ahead and relitigate the last 50 years. <laughs> there's one thing you could have changed, what would it have been in the development of Phoenix? We just don't have a lot of place to plant trees. Just, just in this neighborhood, I, I suspect any of the places that we see vegetation are not really at our disposal as a city to yeah. do planting. This is all private. We don't right. have a public right away in the middle. We'd have to be working with homeowners here. It doesn't mean we can't do it, but it makes it a little bit more yeah. complicated. And we got to get water to those places as well. Now, granted, this is money that local residents, I think, probably buy into it to a point, but how much have you run into any any barriers, any financial barriers? We're only 10 months into having this, this office, uh, and the timing has been really good. The city just received its second allocation of American Rescue Plan Act funding, gotcha. a bonus pot of money, and we're able to put some of that to work for heat mitigation. When that runs out two, three years down the road, when we're we'll having a conversation a about department. the general fund. Right now, great support from mayor, great support from city council, and great support from the public. So let's keep that momentum going. We know there's a lot of community support. Yeah. We, tough conversations absolutely ahead of us, uh, but we're optimistic right now.
people are investing in Phoenix and in the Sun Belt like they never have before, that development brings the risk of additional warming. We clearly don't have everything figured out here yet in Phoenix. People are getting sick and dying from heat at too high a rate. People in neighborhoods like this one ask and are concerned about their neighborhood being hotter than others. So we are still on our learning journey, but we are the hottest large city in the United States. I think we have a couple of strategies that are showing some promise. So we're really happy to be able to have that conversation with other cities and learn what they're doing. We don't have a lot of time for everybody to be improvising solutions on their own. Great interview by Chuck, and look at that new technology there in Phoenix. All right, that does it for us this hour. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.